Looks perfect. Thank you. Okay, great. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, so I just wanted to spend some time uh, to talk about uh, head trauma and some issues. Uh, I was actually going to start off, and I, I think this is very simplistic, but um, that in, in general, you know, when we uh, talk about any sort of traumatic brain injury, uh, I think in you know we we talk about not only you know where the blood is uh, located if there is blood in the head uh, there are closed head injuries without any blood obviously as well uh, but the frontal lobes um, warrant a lot of attention uh, with head injury um, all the behaviors that we see with patients who have severe traumatic brain injuries whether it's uh, inappropriate um, speech uh, lack of attention lack of focus. Uh, kind of this uh, uh, lackadaisical, almost uh, apathetic um, uh, demeanor and personality type. Uh, we all attribute uh, uh, predominantly to frontal lobe injury, even in the setting of a closed head injury uh, without any uh, acute blood or subarachnoid hemorrhage. Uh, so this is just meant to uh, kind of show us that and obviously uh, reorient us to uh, basic anatomy. Uh, the ventricles become important as well. Certainly when we think about uh, cerebrospinal fluid diversion, uh, we think about the ventricles of the brain, and this is just a schematic that I like. Uh, and I think if we're placing an external ventricular drain, having this uh, in our minds in terms of the target and the goal of the catheter into the lateral ventricles and really aiming for the foramen of Monroe uh, gives us a sense of uh, not, the or not only the orientation, but just the... Um, uh, interconnectedness uh, in terms of what we're trying to achieve with the cerebrospinal fluid diversion and relieving pressure. And we'll be discussing a, a situation uh, in a few slides. So this is very simplistic, but you know, when we think about uh, blood in the head, uh, I think trauma oftentimes is an area that seems, uh, you know, relatively simple or straightforward and, you know, um, almost tedious. And I would just say, I think if you think about the value we have in the broader society and just uh, our ability to um, command value as a specialty, uh, I think a lot of it has to do with our ability to deal with traumatic situations in a timely fashion. Not only understanding the decision-making behind whether to operate and how to manage these, these difficult situations, but the timeliness that we provide in terms of accessing care. And I think that can't be understated. Uh, I think oftentimes we think of trauma, uh, you know, as sort of this, this knee jerk. We just, we, we see blood, we, we, we kind of know what the path is. But I think increasingly what we're finding as we study some of these conditions like subdural hematomas, that there's actually a lot of variability. And there might be different ways and different pathways that we can try to manage patients, um, whether or not they're surgical upfront. And so I think there's a lot more to be said in terms of more research in this area and clinical research as to how we approach these problems. Uh, but this schematic basically shows us on the right-hand portion of the screen, you know, we uh, can see intracerebral, intraparenchymal hemorrhages within the brain parenchyma caused often by the small vessels, uh, as you can see here, uh, deep in the brain oftentimes. We can also see intraventricular hemorrhages, either primary or uh, spillover from an intracerebral or intraparenchymal hemorrhage subarachnoid hemorrhages in the, in the bottom of your screen, you can see uh, oftentimes are layering uh, around the sulci. A subdural hemorrhage uh, is uh, one of our most common, um, commonly seen uh, issues, uh, which is uh, obviously below the dura, typically venous bleeding, oftentimes in elderly individuals who have significant atrophy and because they have atrophy and more space between the brain and the inner surface of the dura, uh, they tend to have a, a you know, almost a, um, a fertile environment to have, a, you know, excessive blood accumulate. And so this is, you know, obviously something I would say that's our bread and butter as neurosurgeons is uh, managing patients with subdural bleeds and epidural bleeds, blood uh, that accumulates outside of the dura, the covering of the brain. And we typically associate this with uh, arterial bleeding and fractures oftentimes are associated. And, uh, you know, these are the uh, kind of infamously famous uh, bleeds that we have to um, monitor, either monitor closely or, or act, intervene uh, quickly as these patients can deteriorate rapidly. So I was actually going to take a minute to talk about uh, non-operative head trauma because 
in the grand scheme of things, I think uh, what we often see are the sequela of concussions and, uh, you know, quote unquote, uh, closed head injuries. And there's lots of terminology uh, that's synonymous with concussion, but mild traumatic brain injury, et cetera. And I think what's fascinating to me is as we learn more about even what we classify as mild traumatic brain injured patients, uh, symptoms can last uh, for many months, even up to a year and a half, two years. And I think this is an area that perhaps uh, as we learn more, I think we'll get a lot more recognition for all the sequela that can happen. Uh, I think when we think someone's had a concussion, they haven't lost consciousness, um, we're apt to think that several weeks, you know, should be fine and they should be get, they should be able to get back to baseline. But as I said, I think increasingly, uh, for those of us who follow these patients in, um, in the long term and ask questions related to some of these issues, you know, whether it's headache, uh, fatigue, uh, any sort of amnesia, confu- confusion, dizziness, and even taste or smell disturbances, uh, these can persist for some period of time, even after the initial head injury. So you can see on the right side of your screen, uh, you know, we think about different types of head injury or the mechanisms of head injury um, certainly can cause blood in the head as the left-sided image shows, uh, acceleration, deceleration injuries, et cetera. Um, all important as we think about how we will manage these patients going forward. Uh, I will also say blast injuries are particularly uh are newer, but particularly fascinating in terms of uh, high impact, high velocity trauma, uh, which, uh, you know, may not have as many external signs as even acceleration, deceleration injuries, and may not have as many imaging findings as well. So it's trying to understand how we classify these uh, injuries, and then also how we can um, proactively treat these patients. And obviously, this is often seen with uh, patients in either military exercises or in who have been in active duty uh, or in combat. Did you want me to take questions at the end or as we go along? I wasn't sure. Okay. I'll just keep going and we'll take questions at the end. Uh, and just briefly, you know, post-concussive syndrome is, uh, again, something I think uh, we, you know, you will see a lot, uh, you know, in practice. And I think it's, um, this is an opportunity, I think, for, for neurosurgeons as well, because uh, post-concussive patients can often be managed by uh, other specialties, you know, physical medicine, and rehab, neurology, et cetera. But I think having neurosurgical involvement is very important. Um, certainly, you will see this uh, with patients and identifying what is a post-concussive uh, symptom versus what is something more sinister is very helpful. It will guide your ability to manage, reassure patients, and also know when appropriate times are to obtain imaging or further evaluation. Now, what's important to understand as we were talking about is post-concussive syndro- symptoms can last for a lengthy period of time after an initial injury. So I think it's developing comfort, and this comes with, you know, obviously seeing these patients and and following them, Um, developing a comfort for understanding what a spectrum is of normal. Uh, You know, patients can have persistent memory issues, cognitive issues. We often see a vision, especially with uh, tablets, iPhones, computer screens that are bright. Um, Patients will talk about blurred vision, double vision, uh, which, you know, a lot of it has to do as well with the, uh, with the type of um, monitor that they might be using. So we do see that with patients who have had uh, a quote unquote mild head injury. Uh, Now, anything concerning, that is to say symptoms that just seem out of proportion with the initial injury or several months after weeks after, obviously persistent vomiting, any of those are danger signs and warrant further workup, often starting with an initial head CT to make sure nothing has changed. If there is known intracranial blood that that hasn't expanded, and certainly if there isn't any sort of new issue that might have emerged after the initial event. Um, Patients can have other issues and multiple issues after an injury You can see patients who have a stroke or, you know, have an expansion of a known bleed. So I think keeping that in the back of our minds is always helpful helpful as we see these patients. Now, I just made a point here about recovery, um, because again, I think 
even when you're talking to your family, uh, you know, when folks have had a head injury, mild or even moderate, um, sometimes severe, uh, they might ask you, you know, what can be done or what should be done? Uh, in general, this is what, you know, we suggest to patients, um, you know, remain well hydrated. Uh, we encourage. Hey everyone, Ryan Rad here from neurosurgerytraining.org. If you like that video, subscribe and donate to keep our content available for medical students across the world.